But if you want to preserve your power indefinitely, you have to get the consent of the rule, and this they will do. Everything out of the ordinary is to be reported. The affirmative task we have now is uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. That's an interesting picture. It was a church. Do you know that word? Yes, there were still churches when I was a child. You know, there was a time in human history when God and the hand of science were the same. MK Ultra Mind Control rules in Hollywood. If, if you don't know, Google that and look into it. Some of the names of criminals is hardly informing. Criminals and the salad of patriots. Patriots like patriots. You're listening to Beyond Extraordinary with Natalina. a cold and rainy and slightly wintry feeling uh, day up here in my little slice of paradise in northern Minnesota, right on the border with North Dakota, which I recently was told there's a conspiracy afoot about North Dakota and whether or not it actually exists. So I am going to break that story wide open on extraordinary intelligence in the coming days. So stay tuned for that. You won't want to miss this hard-hitting journalistic endeavor that I am about to undergo. Uh, Hey, everyone, this is Natalina. I really appreciate you listening once again to Beyond Extraordinary. This is episode eight already. I know that's like a really small number in comparison to a lot of people who have been podcasting for a long time. But for me, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, that is episode eight already. Our guest for episode eight is author researcher, filmmaker, blogger, globe trekking extraordinaire, L.A. Marzulli. It's a personal thrill for me to have him on the show tonight because he's really meant a lot to me. His ministry has been really important to me personally. And I think after listening to the show tonight, whether or not you're familiar with his work, you're going to see what a special guy he is. So, Thank you for listening tonight, and I hope you listen to the whole show, and we crammed a lot of information into an hour, and uh, it, it's it's just, we're, we covered a lot of topics, so it's really, really exciting. Um, if you would continue to share the links to my articles that I've written with your friends on ExtraordinaryIntelligence.com on whatever your favorite social networking platform is, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or those are the only two I can really think of off the top of my head. Do people use other ones? If you do, share the links to ExtraordinaryIntelligence.com <laughs> wherever it is that you social media it up. And uh, it means a lot because, of course, word of mouth is the biggest way that we can build our community on ExtraordinaryIntelligence.com. And, uh, you know, Share it in your Facebook groups and whatever, you know, email it to your friends. Uh, Recently posted a couple of new articles, you know, you can dig through the archives. Whatever the case is, that helps me the most when you are out there sharing the things that you like on the show or on the website with other people and then, you know, they share it and that type of thing and it helps build our exposure online. Um, you know, a certain percentage of the exposure we have comes through search engine visibility. And since my site's been around for a number of years, I do have a fair amount of search engine visibility. But really, the gold is when uh, readers and listeners Uh, participate and help us share our message with your friends and and your family and your community whatever the case is (laughs) Um, so 
If you're a member on iTunes, be sure to rate and review the show. That helps increase exposure there on iTunes. We're also in the, um, the podcast is also in the Windows Store. And that's just because I was really pushy and I just emailed one of the developers over at the Windows Store and I said, hey, how does one get their podcast listed in the Windows Store? And he was like, well, unlike iTunes, you can't just sign up and add your subscription. Uh, we just kind of decide which podcasts to include. And since you were forward enough to email me and ask, I'm going to include Beyond Extraordinary in the Windows Store podcast listing. So, hey, if you're ever wondering whether or not it makes a difference to just reach out to people and ask them a question, sometimes you get some great results. (laughs) So we are available in the Windows Store, which I guess is for like Windows phones and I think Xbox or or what have you. So um, I'm not going to yak too much more. If you want to help us out, you know, we always are so grateful for your prayers. And, uh, you know, I say we, but this is kind of a one gal show. (laughs) So I guess I'm using the royal we, perhaps. uh, But I think maybe I'm just referring to the community of readers and listeners and myself at large. But um, we, I always welcome your prayers, and uh, I need your prayers, in fact, to help me know, you know, the direction to take this show. And uh, if you are moved to help me financially to keep the lights on, keep the server running and all of that, I do have a donate button in the right-hand corner or in the right-hand side of ExtraordinaryIntelligence.com, just a PayPal donate button. That means a lot to me. Um, and thank you to those of you who have done so that it's I mean I can't even tell you how much it helps me because this is my job this is what I do so um, and then beyond that uh, keep on sharing the links and I just really appreciate it and send me your emails and if you have ideas suggestions for the show guest suggestions if you have a prayer request go to where it says contact Natalina at the top of my site and you'll be taken to a contact form that actually has a drop down menu that has a bunch of list of options of uh, to help filter your email into the correct uh, uh, take down the correct avenue so I know what's what and uh, just stay in touch because it means a lot to me so all of that said oh 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 and um, if you want to help me but you want something fabulous in return please consider checking out my uh, boutique called Extraordinary Boutique. You see what I did there? Extraordinary Intelligence, Extraordinary Boutique. It's at ExtraordinaryBoutique.com and there's also a link to that at the top of my site. And that's where I sell all of my handmade jewelry that I make. And I also sell a few little kind of vintage fun odds and ends and that also helps me with uh, paying the bills. So I have a ton of stuff. I recently did a wedding where I had to make the necklaces for the bridesmaids and for the bride. And so now that I don't have that occupying my time, I'm going to be adding a ton more of more inter, um, inventory to extraordinaryboutique.com. So check it out. I'm sure there's a special lady in your life, or maybe you yourself are a special lady who is in need of something amazing like that. Okay, enough of the shameless plugs. Let's get into the show with L.A. Marzuli. I'm inclined to believe that it's of an extraterrestrial origin. But because of the ridicule which was heaped upon it, the great amount of censure, he considered it much better for the safety of his own skin and the safety of his own reputation to remain incognito. Something is happening. More and more people around the globe are realizing that UFO sightings are real and they're not going away. We'll take you to one of the world's leading experts in UFOs, Jaime Masson. We traveled to Mexico and interviewed Jaime and his staff. We saw unbelievable things. We'll take you inside and show you that incredible footage. Jose Escamillo will show us what might be hidden structures on the lunar surface. 
We'll take you into the lab with Dr. Roger Lear and Stephen Colbert and examine evidence, physical evidence, of actual UFO encounters. We'll also show you samples that we took from a sphere that supposedly fell from space and crashed into a farmer's field. At the citizens' hearing on UFO disclosure in Washington, D.C., six congressmen got to hear unbelievable things that are actually happening in the skies over the Earth. UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. We have a, a space uh, force. It's in existence. We sat down with Stephen Bassett, the organizer of the conference, and discussed it with him. There's an extraterrestrial presence from elsewhere engaging the planet Earth. We also talked to Chris Putman, co-author of the best-selling book, Exo Vaticana. We sat down with Chris and asked him to explain what the Vatican relationship is with the extraterrestrial phenomenon. The data says that more people believe in E.T. than believe in God. We also interviewed Dr. David Jacob, who took us inside the alien abduction phenomenon. Dr. Jacob also weighs in on what he thinks the end game might be to the alien abduction phenomenon. A few years ago, I was a girl in a really bad place. I was on a quest for inner peace, and all I found was just panic and pain. And I searched for an explanation for why we're here. All I found was more questions. So one night, as I stood in my kitchen, I was washing the dishes, and I turned on the radio and tuned in to Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie. And the guest was this fellow named L.A. Marzulli, and I'd never heard of him before. As I listened, Marzulli was captivating me with discussions of fulfilled prophecies as outlined in what he was referring to as ancient prophetic texts. And he referred to this book called The Guidebook to the Supernatural. I found it so fascinating. I was riveted. All of my life, I had searched for answers to what I referred to as the unexplained and the unknown. And here was a man who was sharing information from a book that purported to contain all of these answers that I was looking for. L.A. Marzulli was talking about the Bible and what he said was making sense. Of course, I'd been exposed to the Bible previous to that moment. I even called myself a Christian earlier in my life. Uh, then I got involved in dabbling in the New Age, but... It wasn't until I heard L.A. Marzulli that night in my kitchen that it came together for me in a way that I, I couldn't deny. It was only a few weeks later that I was saved. So to this day, I believe that L.A.'s unique approach to the Bible is what opened my heart enough to at least consider the truth. And once my eyes were open, the Lord went to work on my heart. So... I am so grateful for L.A. Marzulli and his ministry, and it is a very high honor to have him as a guest on Beyond Extraordinary. So thank you, L.A., and welcome to my show. It's certainly a pleasure to be here, Natalina, and, and the honor is all mine, and uh, all the glory goes to the king, because uh, without him, none of, us, none of us would be where we are today. Oh, amen. And... I, I really want to start because, as you know, just from conversations we've had, my website was started before I was saved. So a large portion of my audience that I've accumulated over the years is, uh, you know, they're non-believers. They're interested in their seeking, but they're not there yet. So what I would love for you to do is tell us a little bit about where you were before you were saved and what you believed, and uh, if you could share some of that with us. I'd love to, and thanks for the opportunity to do that. Um, you know, I was, I was raised Catholic and left the church after uh, the confirmation ceremony when I was about 13. Um, I was instantly drawn to books like Carlos Castaneda, uh, Vision Quest, Hopi Indian Prophecies, I think one of the books which changed my life was Eric Von Daniken's Charity of the Gods, and everything that he said in that book, I mean, it just made perfect sense to me. Um, and, and in fact, since then, I have, was that, I'm already down a rabbit trail, but um, he's right. Something happened in the far distant past. He, <clears throat> he pins it on extraterrestrials, but there is another paradigm which one can embrace, and of course, that is the fallen angelic host. And the books I write and what I try to talk about constantly is that we are in a cosmic battle between these two sides. 
between the fallen angelic host and the good guys. And I believe that these ancient megalithic structures found all over the planet are the result of fallen, I call it fallen angelic architecture, but I digress. But Von Daniken's book was really pivotal for me, and, and it set up, uh, it began to, I began to form my worldview around Von Daniken. Beatles music had a huge influence, especially Eastern mysticism. <clears throat> Carlos Castaneda, as I mentioned earlier, Vision Quest. I experimented with peyote, um, LSD, not as some recreational drug, but in fact to try to break into a, a higher a higher dimension, to try to find inner peace. <clears throat> and found, let me get a slurp here of water. Sure. But essentially found nothing like that. In fact, um, I found just the opposite. And I was a hippie. I was at Woodstock. I inhaled as deeply as I possibly could, unlike our former President Clinton, who, you know, popped <laughs> not inhale. I don't know how that's possible, Bill, but you know, whatever. <laughs> well, I suppose we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Sure. <laughs> but um, after the Woodstock thing, it was about a year later, I was... Um, I saw this brochure, a flyer, tagged to a telephone pole out where I lived. I was living with my parents at that point. Um, had, you know, I've been out on my own. I was now like 21 years old, and I was going nowhere. I had no money, had no job, didn't want to work, just wanted to get high all day and, uh, you know, do a lot of nothing, play a lot of music. I was in a couple of rock and roll bands, and that's what I was doing. So I saw this little, little uh, track, this little pamphlet, flyer, I should say, and said, the, the, the Lord of the Universe is now here. And a picture of this little cherubic 14-year-old kid was on it. And so I, I took my best friend, John Marshall, and I, and we, we trucked down to this place. It was a movie theater, and there was a sort of a, a hippie band playing. And, I mean, this is like 1971. So it's, you know, the Woodstock generation is still doing its thing. And I'm part of that. And the place was packed. I remember sitting on the floor and the guru was late. He was like about an hour and a half, two hours late. And finally he shows up. And everyone in the theater, for the most part, does this thing in, 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 in Hindi. It's called pranam. <clears throat> it means that you prostrate yourself in front of the guru. And for some odd reason, I found myself in front of the guru, you know, flat on my face with my arm, basically worshiping him. And, uh, you know, I was kind of interesting. And he went on. Um, and on and on and on and on. I mean, just yeah, without a comma. You know, in this sing-songy little voice. Well, you think you know the answer to life, but in fact, you don't know where you're going. You're coming and you're coming and going, and you're going hither and there and there and hither. <laughs> and you think you know everything, but without this basic knowledge, you will never find inner peace. And I'm sitting here going, oh, my gosh, this is really amazing, man, for our own. Um, I kind of, I'm sure I sounded a little like that back then anyway. <laughs> Dude, you know, that whole deal. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the next the next day, all of us who were invited, um, I wrote about this in, the, in my testimony in the Cosmic Chess Match, but uh, we were invited to go get knowledge from this Mahatma. Mahatma is a holy man in India. And this guy at that point, Mahatma Fakiranand, was got to be late 50s or pushing 60. had to be. Pretty old guy. Shaved head, this goofy, blissed out smile on his face. You know, he's always really happy. Well, I'm so happy. I don't even know why I'm happy. But that's what he was... Just, just a blissed out guy, as he would call him. And he, you know, he sat in this in this room on a summer day, and listened to this Mahatma go on and on and on and on and on some more. And finally, it's like we got there like nine o'clock, and finally it's four o'clock in the afternoon, and it's been going on forever, you know. And it's like the place is packed and it's hot. And there's no air conditioning. And we're all hippies, so we all stink anyway. And uh, he's he goes, no, I just ain't knowledge. And so. There was this guy there, his name was Dennis. And Dennis was, something had happened, maybe polio, hard to say. He had braces, and he was short and stunted, and he wasn't, you know, well, he wasn't one of the beautiful people, you know. It just, hey, you know, it's That's Dennis, right. and he kind of whined a lot, and nobody kind of liked the guy. And Anyway, so, so Mahatma's there, and, he, and he's opening everyone's third eye, and he gets to me, and he places his finger on the center of my forehead, and all of a sudden, Boom! This is burst of bright light, and I'm just going, whoa, you know, everybody else in the room is doing the same thing. And he opened everybody's third eye uh, in the place. And, of course, looking back at this now, this is a big no-no because it opens, a, it opens a person up into the second heaven. It's a springboard into the occult and the dark forces, 
which mm -hmm. side there. Just In other words, just because we have an experience and we see some white light, uh, so what? That's a light show. We don't know what we're tapping into, you see. And, and, they, and he didn't know what he was tapping into in all honesty. He just figured he, he saw God. So he goes around the room and he, and he does not give Dennis the knowledge. He does not open Dennis's third eye. And Dennis is going, oh, come on, Mahomet G, open my mind. I want the knowledge. And, and he's just ignoring him. And so now he gives the second phase, which is inner music. And he comes over and he has to stick our fingers in our ear. And all of a sudden, I mean, I heard waterfalls and flutes and voices. I mean, I heard that. So did everybody else in the room. So we're tapping into someplace else. We're being opened up into what I would call the lower astral. And we get done and Dennis is whining again. He's going, Oh, Muhammad, gee, I, I wanted to know it's really bad. And he's kind of like grumbling at this point. And, and you can see, I, you know, I, it really bothered me because there was not an ounce of, of love or pity from this supposed Indian holy man towards Dennis. And, of course, this is because of reincarnation. In this guy's worldview, the Muhammad's worldview, Dennis had, must have done something really, really bad in another life to wind up a cripple like this. And so he really had a lot of disdain and, and openly showed it towards Dennis. To cut to the chase, you know, he finally gave Dennis the knowledge, and he, he went on. He shamed him in front of the whole, the whole room. There was about 100 people there were close to that anyway, packed into this house. It was just crazy. People were in rooms and the hallway. And he, and he, like, he called Dennis up there. Of course, Dennis grubbles up, and he goes, you know, are you going to use this knowledge? Will you meditate every day? I mean, he made him just jump through every hoop imaginable. And that always bothered me. It bothered me then, and I didn't understand it. I couldn't articulate it until years later when I became born again and spirit-filled. And I realized that the difference between Mahatma Ji and, and Guru Maharaji was, had Jesus had been there, you know, if Jesus were there, Dennis would have been healed. Right. See? There would have been compassion shown. There was Zippo compassion from this supposed holy man. Now, I was with the Guru for about three years. Uh, I gave up everything. I cut my hair. I... I you know, did the whole deal. I, beca I I wore Indian clothes. I started to have an accent like this without knowing why. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I just was, I was a devotee. I was a follower of Guru Maharaji. I wound up flying to England and playing synthesizers, as we used to joke about, synthesizer in the Guru's orchestra. I was at the Millennium 1974 in the Houston Astrodome. And you can go online uh, for you, those of you are listening. Um, I actually sing Satisfaction. I mean, there's actually recording of me singing Satisfaction. It's just ridiculous. Anyway, uh, and at that moment in the Houston Astrodome, the Holy Family, in quotes, shows up. So it's the mother, the guru, and his three brothers, and they're all on this huge dais, this huge stage. We're on the bottom. The orchestra's on, this, on the bottom platform of this dais, and the audience is about 20 feet below us. Well, up from us is this dais, and probably 20 feet above us or 30 feet above us is the guru's throne. And the guy comes out with this huge crowd and everybody's, you know, singing. And it's this whole deal. Well, we're, we're you know, we're, we're doing the deal. And my, my friend nudges me and goes, look, turn around and look. And I look around. And all these guys were lit up. And I mean that. They were lit up. There was a power in that room. And I would say that that power was the force that, that these guys operate in were manifesting through each, each of the brothers and each of the mother. And the mother. These people are not gods. Uh, he is certainly not the god of the universe. And after, shortly after the Houston Astrodome deal, where where all the promises we had heard, nothing had happened. That's when I started to question it. And there was one point in time, actually, prior to that, just maybe a month earlier, where I was laying on the floor. I awakened up. I awakened at about three o'clock in the morning, or, or some in the middle of the night, anyway. And I I had this horrible dream, and I realized. Uh, to my dismay that I had not changed inwardly. I was still the same wretch that I'd always been. Now, I couldn't articulate it in those terms. All I knew was that I hadn't changed. Yeah, I'd flown around the universe. Yeah, I saw all this stuff and been with the guru, and I was now a strict vegetarian. I was doing all this spiritual stuff, but inside, I wasn't changed. And I wept uncontrollably, deep, deep, bitter tears for a period of time and shortly after I left the guru and this is like 74 in the 75 and uh, that was sort of the beginning of a five year I'm not really interested in, in God he doesn't really exist 
you know, and I did some vision quests and, and spirit guides and all this other stuff and messed around with that. And when I became a Christian five years later, which is now 1980, which is 33 years ago for me, everything changed. And uh, I had let a lot of stuff, I had opened myself up to a lot of entities, which I unknowingly never should have done. And uh, because I did that, um, uh, there were some serious repercussions, let's just put it that way. And uh, I, I went through what I would call spiritual boot camp. I had two mentors. One was my pastor. One was my first real mentor, Wayne Kendall, who I dedicated the Cosmic Chess Match to. And so that's a, a little bit about my background. And that's 33 years ago. And now I – look, I've been on both sides of the aisle, Natalina. I know what these guys are talking about. I've been there, done that. And all I can say is, like you heard me that night on, on, on Coast to Coast, you know, let me um, let me just throw the phone in the other room. Hold on. Yeah, sure. It's, um, you know, having been on both sides of the aisle here, the people, they think they know Jesus. They think they know what this is. And unfortunately, they oftentimes uh, equate it to church. And that's not what it, we're talking about here. Um, it's it's a whole different deal when we actually uh, um, embrace him and bring up, bring him into our lives. It's it's not what people think it is, and it's real and it's profound and it's life changing. And the peace I was so desperately looking for, as was everyone else, um, in you know way back in the '60s and all that stuff. Um, it only comes from one place, you know, like all these gurus can say inner peace and, you know, transcendental meditation, all this nonsense. All it does uh, is, it, is it masks the basic problem. And the basic problem with human beings is we're all depraved, you know. You don't think so? Look what happened in Washington yesterday. Don't think so? Look at the uh, uh, the 50 kids killed in the, in the Christian school in Nairobi, uh, hacked to death in the middle of the night by Islamic extremists. Don't think so? Look at the people who are just gunned down indiscriminately by crazy people. Evil exists, and people are uh, sometimes embrace that evil. Sometimes uh, they're given over to it, whether it's through drugs or the cult or whatever. And this is the result, what we see. Uh, peace comes from one man, and that's Yeshua or Jesus. And I'm not talking a religion here or going into a building. It's literally a personal relationship. And when we ask, he comes in. And he comes in in ways that are just absolutely profound. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand that, and they equate, let's say, the Sunday school or the Christian camp they were forced to go to, or they got molested by a pastor or a priest or whatever, and that's what they think Jesus is, and it's not. It's not who he is. It's not what he's about. All I can tell you is when, when, when we open ourselves up to him, when we just ask him to come in, and that, that's, our bar that's the bargain. We say, hey, you know, I don't know who you are, but I believe in you. And I want you to come into my life because I've done stuff which is nasty. And I, I can't get rid of the, the, the feelings that I have because of the nasty stuff I do. What I mean by that is, you know, the anger, the bitterness, the lying, the cheating, the whatever human beings do, uh, we're garbage dumps, as my first mentor used to say. And we got no place to take that. And the thing is, the miracle of, of a relationship with him is we confess those things. We tell him those things. We go, you know, I, I've done this. I've done that. I'm sorry for him. And guess what? He removes those things from us. We're not, all of a sudden, we're not burdened down. We find peace. We find forgiveness. Um, it's a process, and sometimes it's slow. I remember with my parents, it took probably four, about maybe five years before they really started to look at my faith and go, wow, this is this isn't a fad like the guru. Maybe there's something to this. And it took another probably 25 years after that before my dad on a walk. He's got Alzheimer's now, but on the on stages, the onset of a disease, the early stages of a disease, I asked him, Dad, do you want to be born again? And he said, yeah, I'd like that very much. And we prayed together. He's a lifelong Catholic, but he never really had asked Jesus into his heart. You know, he never had really done that. And so we did that. Now he like probably doesn't know who I am when I walk into the room. Same thing with my mother. We never had a relationship. And these things take time, but they're healed. People get healed of them. And it happens 
those are the miracles that, that are not, not talked about. The family ties that were severed and now are joined back together. Uh, the relationships between husband and wife, which were just about to go south and divorce with the kids and the whole deal, and all of a sudden the marriage is, is back and, and there's real love there. And that's the stuff that he does. That's the stuff he loves to do. Um, there's been healings in my life where he's come in and, and healed me instantaneously of things. So that's that's the God that we're talking about, and he's the real one in my opinion. Well, everything that you've just said resonates with me so much, L.A. I'm so thankful for you sharing that story with me. You know, I can think of when I was really, really deep into the New Age. I was looking for something to... Uh, give me that inner peace that they always promise and give me that uh, you know sense of they, they use really flowery language like universal oneness and Christ consciousness and all of this and I I was searching for it. I was trying to, you know, more buzzwords, create my own reality, <laughs> you know, and, and and draw all of this to myself and, and what it ended up, and I didn't realize it at the time, is the deeper I got into it, the worse I felt, the more anxiety I had, the more I had these panic attacks and 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 just I, I was falling apart at the seams and I kept digging deeper thinking, well, maybe I'm not doing it right. Maybe I'm not following the right person uh, or the right philosophy. And, and, and my life was just becoming a mess. And it wasn't until that moment, that wonderful moment where I just gave myself to Jesus and I just... And, and you know, it, it sometimes it's sloppy. Sometimes, I mean, I think I was just like, okay, <laughs> let's do this. And he was like, all right, let's do this. And my life just completely, as you said, it completely changed. And things were coming together for me that had been broken for years. And um, if there's one thing that I would really want to communicate to people is that everything that you've tried up till this point has failed you. Tr th this, is, this is something real. This is something that will actually transform your life and change you. And, you know, L.A., I find that a lot of people, yourself, myself, I think of people like um, Russ Dizdar, right. so many people came out of the New Age into uh, full belief in Jesus. And it seems like those of us who have seen the other side, and who have experienced the the supernatural from the dark side, let's say, feel this this need and desire to reach out to people and show them uh, w that what they're dabbling in is really serious stuff. Did you feel compelled right away to to just try to, you know, take on a ministry and 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 reach people was that something instantaneous or was that developed over time no, it was definitely developed over time my first three years was just trying to survive and get through it and um you know i went i went when the church was open i was there i attended every bible study i possibly could i slept with a bible clutched to my chest probably for the first year um that's how severe it was um what i went through i wouldn't wish it on anybody but i had opened those doors and um uh, it took a while to learn how to, you know, close them, not only close them, but then also to learn what spiritual warfare was and, and how to, you know, put on the armor of God on a daily basis. And the ministry really came slowly. And I would say I was, you know, because I was, I'm a musician, a musician, um, I was thrust into, I became a worship leader probably within two years of being a Christian. And I was, you know, which is kind of, they shouldn't have really done that. There was no training. I never sat under anybody. It was like, okay, you're the worship leader. There was a split in the church is what happened. <laughs> Literally, it was a split in the church. They knew I played. All of a sudden, okay, you're the worship leader. And I'm going, oh, what do I do? And I went, remember, went to Pastor Fred. And I said, I have no idea. And he said, just get up there, play the songs. I'll show you what to do. Don't say anything to the people. So I never spoke to the people. I never, like, I just would just play the music and, and try to enter into worship. And that's how I cut my teeth. And it wasn't until um, probably 10 years as a Christian, 1990, uh, and shortly before that, that I started to really um, look at things intellectually and as sort of like 
a part of my brain which has been you know abused let's shall we say uh mm-hmm. to uh you know uh toxic substances and i don't say that with uh, uh any degree of pride it's just oh my gosh um that sort of kicked in and i began to really uh look at what i was doing and and the writings of frank peretti certainly were an inspiration to me and uh, a book by dr ide thomas caught my attention which was called the omega conspiracy and after reading that book that opened my eyes and all of a sudden the parts of the bible which had never made sense like the flood sodom and gomorrah uh the conquest of 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 canaan where the mandate comes out to wipe everybody out i never understood any of that until i read dr thomas's book and then all of a sudden everything uh made really made began to make sense and i uh i found out that he lived close by i live in southern california and i I called him up this is long before the days of email I called him up and reached him and talked to his secretary and made an appointment and did an interview with him. And that was the first of, uh, of my rela- uh, times with Dr. Thomas and, and a relationship with him, which was ongoing, really. Uh, he's the same age as my dad. He's got 93. And like my dad, he's got Alzheimer's. So he's, um, I saw him a few years back, and I need to go see him again just to come in and just pay my respects. But um, that book changed my life and set me on the course that I've been been on ever since. And it really kicked in the high gear, uh, really in the high gear when I wrote Politics, Prophecy, and the Supernatural, uh, which was 2007. And since then, we've done the Cosmic Chess Match, Alien Interviews, and of course, uh, the newest book, Amitrail of a Nephilim. I'm now working on Amitrail of a Nephilim Volume 2, and we're actually doing a, uh, a, a, re- a redo, a, a redux of... Um, alien interviews i think we're going to change the title because we've got all this new information we've, i've gone back and and interviewed dr jacobs dr uh, uh george filer and and other people plus we've got tons of testimony and uh we're going to uh use that in, in the new book and and natalina i um i'd like to you know i just i just thought of this and this is on the air but um i'm not sure that i ever interviewed you about you know your conversion and stuff and your the whole new age thing. I don't know, you know, what kind of UFO stuff you were into, but I'll shoot you an email. We'll talk about this off the air, but maybe you could weigh in on this new book too with a with a short interview. That would be kind of fun. And uh, you know, here we are. It's 2013, and uh, it seems like all hell is beginning to break loose. And I, I blog six days a week and, and and talk about the ancient prophetic texts, the Bible, which are coming true. And um, I just think that we're in very turbulent. Uh, unprecedented tumultuous times and you know it's funny that you mentioned that uh, about my past UFO experiences you know um, I think a big part of what appeals to people about what you do in your ministry is because you know you look at all of these polls that are coming out and something you know the vast majority of people worldwide believe in UFOs in fact I saw a poll just the other day that said something like one in 10 people th- say that they've seen one and, uh, and a spaceship, you know, of some kind. And, and the, the question is, why is the church so afraid to talk about it? Because the other side is talking about it. I just uh, posted an article on my site about, uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh, the trans channeler named Bashar and he, of course, teaches all of the things that we're talking about, except that it's good. For example, abductions, hybrid program, all of this stuff. They talk about how, you know, if you've been abducted, don't be afraid because it's just a soul bargain you made in a previous existence saying, giving permission for it to happen. You know, it's all for the greater good. So the other side the new age and the occult they're talking about it they believe it a hundred percent they've seen it they manifest it they they know what it is but christians for whatever reason are so afraid to talk about it but as you said in the very first watchers it's real it's burgeoning and it's not it's not going away it's becoming uh it's becoming more and more prevalent clearly so what do you say to christians who think that's something that we should just stay away from that's that's scary and icky we shouldn't talk about it well, i think that's absurd in fact this this year in every single conference that i've attended i i start my presentation by saying 
Um, we believe in the virgin birth, talking donkeys, floating axe heads, two gold coins which appear out of the mouths of fish, staffs which when thrown down become serpents, uh, water, waters that stand up as a heap and, and create dry land, men that walk on water, men that rise from the dead, um, men that are swallowed by whales and then regurgitated three three days later, men that call out the future with great specificity, and on and on it goes. And then I say, do we realize how absolutely nuts so that is? Because it is. It's crazy, crazy stuff. You know, go down to your psychiatrist and tell him that your horse has been talking to you. And of course, I'm speaking of, of Balaam and Balak. And, and this is what we as Christians believe in. We listen to the stories in the Bible, or what I prefer to call it, the guidebook of the supernatural, because Bible just means book. And I don't mean, you know, any uh, irreverence by that. I'm just saying, to me, it's a guidebook to the supernatural, because when we read it, we understand, oh my gosh, we're at war, because that's what we really are. We're at war, and a cosmic war has descended upon this planet um, with the fallen ones, the fallen angelic hosts, and the good guys. And they've been going at it, and the, uh, the goal is to try to suck as many of uh, men and women as they possibly can on the other side. And right now we're doing a wonderful job of it. But we believe in all these supernatural events. Why is it that when we walk out of the church, we flip the switch and we have what is called cognitive dissonance. All of a sudden we're just going to go, I can't relate to that. Well, let me get this right. You just sat in church and heard about a virgin birth. You know how nuts that is, right? It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, crazy stuff, but it's what we believe in because we're talking about a supernatural God who interfaces with us always in a supernatural way. I mean, look, everywhere Jesus goes in his ministry, he's always doing stuff. Every, everywhere he goes, people get healed, people get saved, people get delivered. Every place he goes, wherever he walks, the natural is being superseded by the supernatural. Well, we're told in Second Thessalonians that Satan will come with all signs and lying wonders. And this begs the question, okay, what should we, what we should be looking for? What should we be looking for? And what's manifesting to the tune of over a thousand sightings per month, and it's been that way now since April, hovering around a thousand sightings a month worldwide. Guys, it's not all swamp gas reflecting off a weather balloon that's caught in a flock of geese that's uh, showing the planet Venus. It, it, it's not that. You know, that's not what we're looking at anymore. Something is going on. And uh, where Watcher 7 is, 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 is called UFOs, um, Physical Evidence, in the accompanying book, which we're going to do that, which, again, is expanded. It started off, it's, the, it's my other book called Alien. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know how much that, I just hit my microphone mute. Um, yep. Yeah. You, were, you were just about to mention the alien interviews. And so that the alien interview book is we're re redoing it as I said earlier, and we're probably going to put a new title on it. And uh, because of all the new information and pictures and photos, and the bottom line is we're trying to show people um, on both sides of the aisle the Christian Church needs to wake up and understand what it is you're facing. I'll tell you something. I have a lot of hope. I was up at Sparks, Nevada, at Pastor Rick Fuhrer's, and I consider Rick a very close friend <laughs> if he ever hears this. And uh, and, and, and Rick had invited all the pastors around. And, you know, we all know how it usually goes. No one ever shows up. Well, I spoke for over two hours on Friday night. Eight pastors from different churches and ten assistant pastors from different churches showed up to that conference. Unbelievable. And many of them came back and listened all day Saturday, which is like a six-hour marathon on the whole Nephilim thing. But the first two hours on Friday was just on the UFO phenomena. And, you know, I'm not sitting here just talking about, um, you know, or maybe showing some grainy photos. I mean, I've got videos, and, and, and let's say Paul Hellyer, who's the former defense secretary from, from Canada, getting up and saying UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. Um, the evidence is overwhelming, Natalina. And at some point in time, someone, more than likely the President of the United States, will address the American people <coughs> and say something like, UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. And we've known about them for years, and it's time time we make an adjustment. Either at some point that's going to happen. And, um, you know, if the church doesn't address it soon, we will lose. The, we're, we're already being dominated by the New Age guys, the ancient alien crowd, the UFO crowd, guys like Grael. The conversation is being dominated by those guys. There's only a handful of us uh, in the Christian community who are even addressing this. And this is what's manifesting. You know, this is why it's just everywhere. It is un 
unbelievable how much it's manifesting. You know, a thousand UFO sightings in the month of April, nine hundred in the month of August and September. Come on, folks, wake up! Absolutely, and I think that the it's so important because you know you speak about uh, the prophecy about this coming great deception, and it fits so well with the UFO phenomena because what is being taught in New Age circles, who, as I said fully believe in in this situation they claim to be in contact in the whole nine yards you know the galactic federation and all that stuff uh, yeah. they, they they're expecting it they think it's wonderful they think it's love and light but some of that is bleeding into mainstream thought you know what if these are our benevolent space brothers what if they're here to help us to evolve to that next level and it even kind of plays into the um environmental movement and and uh, mother earth gaia or whatever you want to say uh that these these space brothers from afar are watching us and they're going to swoop in and help us and it seems like it's all setting the stage for that deception which is why i think the first step is understanding that it is happening that it is real you know take the blinders off and recognize that this is happening okay great now what do we do with it? So I'm really excited for Watcher 7 because the very fact that it's called physical evidence is exactly what people need to see. I saw that you are speaking with Jaime Masson. Uh, it, tell us a little bit about Watcher 7. What, what are we looking for? Here? What, what are we going to see? Well, uh, actually, we've talked to Jaime Masson, Dr. David Jacobs, Chuck Missler, uh, Jim Williamson, Gary Stearman, uh, Chris Putman, a, a whole host of people that have looked at the phenomena. <coughs> Give me a second. And let me get a slurp here. Sure. And what's interesting is um, all the people that we've talked to have examined and looked at the phenomena. They're well acquainted with it. Uh, Putman, of course, brings to the table the whole uh, Exovatic Can of a title of his best selling book, co authored with Tom Horn. And he brings to the table the idea that the Vatican uh, is extolling the virtues of an extraterrestrial savior. They are awaiting an extraterrestrial savior. They they uh, are embracing an extraterrestrial savior. Um, it's extremely interesting where the Vatican is at. Uh, Balducci, uh, who's a Monsignor spokesperson for the Vatican, has stated that we should treat the extraterrestrial as our brother. Then we get guys like Dr. David Jacobs, who is been examining the uh, abduction phenomena for decades. And he is he is appalled at what he sees without putting words in his mouth. Um, he's afraid. He doesn't have a very good feeling about what this thing is. Um, he used to have a lot of hope, he says. Now he doesn't have a lot of hope because he's taken aback. Um, it, he's, he has a very dark view of the abduction phenomena. And frankly, I agree with him totally. It's just that he will take the next step, and um, he refuses to look at anything supernatural, and uh, that doesn't exist in his paradigm. So I can't offer a possible solution and a way out of what he's seeing, unfortunately. We sat down with Dr. Roger Lear, um, who's, who's done, what is now, 16 implant removals, and we have a man who has an implant removal in his knee, who's been abducted since he was five, uh, many times, <clears throat> And we're going to pick up in Watchers 8 uh, as we go into the operating theater with this man, Bill. That's his, not his real name. And we will remove the implant uh, and get it all on film. And then take it to a scanning electron microscope and uh, examine it there. Uh, these things have carbon nanotubes in them, double-walled carbon nanotubes. Uh, <clears throat> I believe that they are changing. My theory is that they are changing the host DNA. And so we're in the lab uh, looking with Dr. Roger Lear and Steve Colbert, a chief scientist uh, that works for Dr. Lear as, as part of our team now. We just thank them both for it because they're both just wonderful, wonderful guys. And they're, uh, you know, they're part of the, sort of the Watchers family, uh, both guys are. And um, uh, w there was a man who had been abducted. And when Dr. Lear went to his house to examine uh, the, the site, uh, the fig tree, or the avocado tree in the back burst into flames. The kitchen counter at countertops and 
wooden cabinets were magnetized. Get this, the bed where the man was laying and abducted from, his half the bed was magnetized. Her side of the bed was not. Next to the wind, next to the bed was the window. And on that window, he found when he used a fluorescent light, a handprint. The owner allowed him to take the handprint, um, actually take that entire piece of wallboard, uh, cut it out, and then they put a new piece in and painted the room, the whole deal. But we had that piece of wallboard in the lab with a four-fingered handprint on it, and it fluoresced in the lab, and then we tested it. And what was interesting is we uh, put this under a scanning electron microscope with an EDX feature. Where an EDX machine will read and tell us what we're looking at, what, what it's made from, what, what compounds, what minerals were there, okay, on the periodic chart. And the technician who was there with us said that uh, I asked him point blank, I said, what are we looking at as a human? He said, no, whatever this is, it's not human. There's not any, anything remotely human about it. And we all kind of look at each other and go, you know, it's like a smoking gun. Now, unless someone's walking around with a four-fingered, you know, uh, fake handprint that somehow fluoresces, which they're not, obviously, uh, it's a smoking gun. Of course, the skeptics will point at this and <clears throat> come up with all sorts of ridiculous answers as to why it's not real. But it is real, and it's physical evidence. And it shows that these entities are interacting with us and they are doing the unthinkable. They are abducting people against their will and inserting objects in their bodies. And this is not a good thing, especially if you're a five-year-old. Absolutely. And um, also in Watcher 7, you talked to Stephen Bassett. And now he was recently involved in the hearing on disclosure, the citizen hearing on disclosure, right? He was the organizer of it. Yeah, he was the organizer of it. We sat down with him and... Uh, I had a very frolicking interview with him. And, uh, you know, Bassett believes, as I do, that at some point there will be disclosure, um, whether it's from the president or, look, we're seeing soft disclosure now. We are. We're, you know, the news media is beginning to treat the subject differently than what they did 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was always this. Hey, Bob, uh, you just hear about that strange lights in the sky. <laughs> oh, that's right, Fred. They're back. E.T. seems to be back, and he's hovering over Chicago. And here's the clip. And then they cut to some, you know, reporter who's yucking it up on the site. And it's just nonsense. <clears throat> and remember, these guys are reading off a teleprompter and they're told what to do, you know, and, and they're told how to, how to broach the subject. Well, at least now in some mainstream media outlets, we are seeing that discourse is actually happening, that people are beginning to treat the subject with uh, the gravity or, or, the, or the intellectual integrity that it really deserves. What's great about Jaime Musan's show is it's aired for, for years down in Mexico. It's seen by millions of people, um, you know, millions of people, a lot more than 3 million people, millions of people. And he, he does this two-hour show like every week. And people from all over the world uh, show or, or send Jaime Musan their videos. And we were privileged to go down there, talk to Jaime, look at everything. And Jaime gave us like, like, I think, two terabytes of uh, UFO footage, which we can use, which is just unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Right. And actually, it probably largely is due to the amazing evidence that Jaime has produced, but it seems that Mexi the Mexican government isn't as afraid of disclosing some of what they know about the UFO phenomena. They seem like they've been, at least in comparison to the United States, a little bit more forward with what they what they know with their UFO files, etc. I bet that uh, m much of what Jaime has released has, has maybe contributed to that. Well, absolutely. I mean, Jaime, Jaime is, is constantly bringing this to the public eye. Uh, the Mexican government has, has uh, acknowledged the existence of UFOs, as well as the UK, Great Britain, obviously. Um, France, Belgium, Germany, Japan, um, and other other states um, have other countries that have come out and said, "Look, they're here. We know that they're here." And um, you know, Paul Hellyer, Canada, ex defense minister of the Canadian government, you know, air, UFOs or as real as the airplanes that fly overhead. I mean, I mean, what is it going to take? And no one cares. I mean, in this country, it is just it astounds me how the people are asleep. You know, it's football, it's baseball, it's Dancing with the Stars. It's what's the latest annex of the of the idiot, you know, the, the horror Babylon this week 
whether it's Madonna or Lady Gaga or the new one, of course, uh, Miley Cyrus, it just becomes, mm-hmm. and all this does is it's like, it's like bread and circus. They're, they're clowns or media distractions. Now, of course, we've got the weasels in Washington shutting down the government. The first thing you do is close the World War II, you know, vet, veterans, uh, um, uh, um, the word, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. Memorial. The memorial. Thank you. And it's like, you know, it, it's all, it's all show and tell. It's all dog pony show. I mean, this is ridiculous. There's actually a clip that someone sent me, and I don't know who this guy is. Uh, i got to do some research on it. But he's on a panel. You know, it's a typical nightly news nonsense that we see where, you know, four people around and there's a panel, and these, are, these guys are the pundits. And what really drives me nuts is when, when there's a speech by the president, all these people dissect it and tell us what we've just seen. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. We need you to tell us because we're complete morons and idiots and have no idea how, how, really what the English language says. Thank you for deciphering it for us. I mean, it's, it's exactly. just amazing. Anyway, this guy was on the air, and he lost it, and he lost it in a good way. He was, at, he was kind of, I mean, I related to it because I'm a passionate man, and he was too. And he said it, you know, he said it succinctly and, and just with an incredible amount of verb. And, and the other host, two women and another guy, they're all kind of going, oh, my God, now what do we do? This is not part of the script. He's gone off the reservation type of deal. And he's going, do you realize we're 16 to $17 trillion in debt and no one's doing anything about it? And he's right. You know, Congress is just, it's, it's a joke. Raise the debt ceiling. I mean, it's an absolute joke as to where we are in this country. It is a house of cards, and it's all connected. That's what people don't get. It's all connected. You know, have you noticed, and I'm, I'm on a rant here, have you noticed that I just, my daughter subscribes to some, she's 22, okay? She, it's either People Magazine or We or Us, or I, one of those things, right? And on it, it's like Kate's new house. Why do I care about Kate? Why do I care about the royal baby? I, you know, I wish them well. I don't wish them any ill will. Don't misunderstand me. But it's royalty. Why do I care anything about royalty? We fought the American Revolution, and it's in our Constitution that no one will have a royal title. Why do I care about this stuff? Why are you jamming it down my throat? You know, at one time, we didn't pay taxes in this country. Now everything we do is taxed, including death. We are tact, we are modern day serfs. Literally, we are modern day serfs. That's all we are. We work and all our profit goes to the government in the form of taxes. We basically never can get ahead. You gotta make a whole lot of money to get ahead. And you know, and now they're doing the reverse mortgage thing. They got some actor up there, you know, yeah, you can get that reverse mortgage. It's just what you need to have peace of mind and security. Excuse me, they're taking your house from you. It's just exactly. You know, it's just it's unbelievable where we are, and uh, that's enough of that. We should probably get back on track, but I feel better <laughs> now. Thank you. <laughs> well, it, it's so interesting when you talked about Kate because I have a friend who works in production for a I'll just say a major news outlet and a local affiliate, but you know they're all connected and. He was talking about how when the royal baby nonsense was going on, he was asked to do this big uh, feature about it on the local news affiliate. And just on principle, he was just refusing to do it because he says, uh, you know, exactly what you said. You know, we fought we fought for our independence from this nonsense. Why are we deifying these people? Why do I care about this baby? And um You know, I I think it was Huffington Post, who normally is very liberal leaning, but they did a really great article uh, on it at the time where they said, um, you know, woman has baby expected that within 18 years, this baby is going to move out. And, you know, essentially, who cares? It's a baby. Uh, Lots of people have them. (laughs) You know, it's 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 interesting how we are we are led in what it is that we're supposed to be interested in. And, uh, you know, of course, pe- people uh, who watch your documentaries and read your books, they should also know that you do blog almost every day of the week and you talk about current events and that type of thing. Um, when I was just getting ready to talk to you tonight, I was walking by the television and just some random news channel was on. And they were talking about... Uh, Oh, who knows what? It was something, some celebrity thing. And then all of a sudden, the TV flashes, and it says, nuclear waste leaking from Fukushima. (laughs) Oh, yeah, baby. (laughs) 
Right. Officials are worried. And then instantly it clipped over to Miley Cyrus. Just as though, you know, here, we're just letting you know about this, but it's not important. Moving on. Look Miley, look at Miley. Keep looking it, at Miley. Unbelievable. <laughs> it really is. Now, I wanted to ask you, because I always love getting your take, and everyone who's listening probably already knows why, I really love getting your take on current events. Let's talk a little bit about um, this recent, this woman who was shot in Washington, D.C. You know, it, it, and, and and on top of that, this man from several weeks ago who shot up the in Virginia, the the comment you know we're we're taught that they're crazy they were they were lunatics it's coming out this woman was they're saying she was schizophrenic but there's a common bond that both of them claimed that they were hearing voices that they were uh feeling that they were under surveillance that there were in, in the case of I can't remember his name now but the 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 previous shooter that he was saying that he was being tormented by the government both in both cases it really brings to mind like russ Dizdar's black awakening or you know something what what's your opinion on what is going on there well i mean first of all if, if you're taking a car and crashing it into a barricade there's going to be repercussions and it's not like it was maybe 30 years ago before we had islamic terrorism and all the crazy stuff that, that happens now and you know my wife and I talked about this this morning, and I said, well, okay, let's pretend I'm a cop, and I'm on duty, and, you know, this crazy woman comes up and crashes her car. I don't know who's in the back seat. I don't know whether the car is rigged for explosives. I don't know anything. I don't know whether there's, like, a shooter like, like the Washington shooter a few years ago where they've cored a hole out, and there's a sniper in the back, <clears throat> you know, laying flat in the back seat into the truck and seeing, and, and I have no idea what I'm looking at. You know, is the car wired for explosives? And so all I know is some crazy person has taken their car and done something that they shouldn't have done. And uh, I have and I'm fighting for my life at that point. And I understand why the cop shot. I mean, I get it. It's a tragedy. Um, but let me put it this way. Let's say the, 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 the scenario I just I just uh, painted was a reality. We see in Iraq. Oh, that's like every seven days. Another nutcase blows himself up, and it's always in a car for the most part. <clears throat> Fifty people, a hundred people are killed. A couple hundred people were wounded, and that's the way of life. That's how they play games over there. That's what they like to do. And there, it's over here. Uh, we haven't seen it really fully manifest yet, but it's here, and eventually it will. It will start to manifest, whether it's a false flag event or it's the real deal. And so with that in mind, if you're in law enforcement, I mean, you, you don't know what you're looking at anymore. It's not like it was 30 years ago. It just isn't. You just don't know. And so somebody crosses that line, and, you know, at that point, you, you shoot to kill. And I understand his reaction. Um, on the other hand, what's going on with the woman? Why does she, First of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a prediction. She's on some kind of psychotropic medicine, just like he was. And this stuff opens you up. Both these people, well, he was, you know, look, this guy could have been a program shooter. And in some ways he already is because if he's really, I can't remember the guy's name, the Washington guy, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, he, I can't remember his yeah, name either. He's like playing 16 hours nonstop violent video games. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And he's on psychotropic medication at the same time. It's not the guns, folks, you know. We have a culture yeah. which breeds violence. And I, I saw the new Wolverine movie. I mean, I wrote about this the day after the shooting. You know, and the body count was unbelievable in the first 15 minutes. It's like, oh, my gosh, Wolverine's just slashed his way through 50 people. Well, what kind of culture is this? And this is what we embrace here. You know, this is what, this is what we see day after day after day. And then they want to blame the guns? No, folks, it's not the guns. It's the violent videos. It's the slasher movies like Saw and the nonsense. I mean, it's like we are one sick culture. One yeah. culture. But, you know, Natalina, take the prayer out of the school. Make sure you can't mention Jesus or even God at a graduation because you might offend somebody. Make sure that we have transgender bathrooms in first grade. That will really screw up the whole bunch of people. Make sure we pass legislation for that. But keep our borders open. I mean, we are so whacked out. Make sure 
that we can kill as many babies as we possibly can, but you can't cut down an oak tree in your own property without getting a permit for it. Do you realize if I have a daughter who's 16 and she's pregnant, she can remove that baby. She can kill the baby through abortion. But if I have an oak tree on my property that's fallen down and dead, I've got to get a permit to get it removed. And I'm not making this up. Where is the outrage? This is, this is the country I live in. Natalina, i got news for you. I prayed, and the Lord's not having me move. I'm not getting marching orders. I wish I was. But I, if I ever get him, I'll be out of here in 30 seconds. This place is not so. But then again, if I leave, who will do what I do? You know, someone else will pick it up. I'm, I'm not unique. The Lord will raise somebody else up. But he's called me to this position. He's called me to do what I do. And, you know, we're, we're on the trail of a Nephilim. We're constantly doing Watcher stuff. And i, I got to tell you, we're actually toying with uh, – a weekly TV show, and you're the first person I've told that to. And uh, why not sort of announce it now? Uh, but we are really contemplating a half-hour weekly TV show, Watchers TV, and um, there will be more more on that as uh, time goes on. But we are seriously considering it. I think that's fantastic, and I have thought for a long time that there's a serious need for that because you know every day when i turn on the television if i flip it over to the history channel what am i seeing ancient aliens okay. if i flip if i flip it to the news i'm hearing about you know deranged shooters but there's no context there's no spiritual context for what it is that i'm seeing and there's what people don't understand is that there is a spiritual context for everything whether it the, i guess uh, his name was Aaron Alexis uh okay. the Right, and he, you know, he he sitting he 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 thought he was being controlled by electromagnetic waves, and he was on these this medication. And I think it has come out that this other woman was on medication for schizophrenia, um, the the one w uh, with the Washington car chase. Right. And and you know, if people don't have this supernatural worldview or this spiritual context for what it is that they are seeing, all they're doing is they're absorbing and they're absorbing the the negativity. There's even a spiritual context for Miley Cyrus, if we're being honest. I mean, there's there's this this concerted effort to shape the public mind and accept this disgusting stuff that we're seeing as normal as this is just the way it is and you should accept it and and then turn on MTV and revel in it you know even when you come down to like Kesha who sings about we're going to die young it's all about just this defeatist attitude and live for today cuz there's probably not going to be a tomorrow and nobody understands that you know there <laughs> there is going to be tomorrow and there is there are implications to what you're doing right now so what what you just said about the possibility of doing a regular television show to you, you would never run out of things to talk about that's for sure yeah and, and you know we're excited by that and the, and, and you just nailed it one of the reasons the reason uh, that we want to do it is because we have a voice and uh we we've, we've been uh, working on that voice through watchers and through the books and, and it's time to go more frequent. And uh, what better way to do that is to bring guests in and talk about the issues, talk about the things of, of the day. And we are really seriously considering doing it. And uh, it's sort of in the works, and um, I'll be talking more about it as, as time goes on. Well, I'm excited about it, and I'll, I'll pray about it, too, Thank because you. I think that's really, really needed. And while we wait for more information about that, when can we expect Watcher 7? Watcher 7 and the new book uh, will come out in tandem probably sometime early November uh, before Thanksgiving, and um, we're excited about it. It's, it's probably one of the most ambitious uh, of the Watcher series that we've done. We flew all over the place, conducted a lot of interviews. We've got some amazing footage, and uh, I think the production value is Rick has done an amazing job editing, and it's definitely going to be 90 minutes. It might be longer. Uh, so it's uh, – and, you know, Rick's editing style – uh, there's not a fixed camera um, on a tripod. He's moving around the room and he's cutting from scene to scene and always, always moving because people I mean, they just they get bored really easily. Uh, <laughs> we're so used to oh how many how many people got killed? You know it's Homer Simpson. You know it's like unless I see somebody die I'm not interested type of thing. 
And uh, yeah, so Rick has uh, done a masterful job with the editing, and I, the parts I've seen just look really good. And we're excited. Plus, we've got Chuck Missler, Gary Stearman, and uh, Jim Williamson, Chris Chris Putnam, all weighing in on the phenomena from a Christian perspective, and, and George Filer as well, which is fascinating. So, look, you, anybody who's seen the Watchers know that we don't Bible thump and start you know pounding people over the head. We present the evidence. And the reason for this is we don't want to preach to the choir. The choir already knows what's going on. We want to preach to the people on the other side of the aisle who are going, oh, yeah, UFOs, man, they're far out of our space brothers. Come on down. We want, to, we want to reach them. And, you know, there was a time if you said John 3.16 to me, well, who's John and what's 3.16? I had no idea what you were talking about. Why do we insist on, on you know, talking in this ridiculous Christianese language, that code that only we understand? And you'll never see that in Watchers. If we, we mention scripture, we immediately clarify what it is we're talking about. Because we hope that the people that watch the show, uh, not only the Christian TV audience, but the, the millions of secular people out there who don't know who Jesus really is, have preconceived notions. Look, there's a guy, there's a guy on, on Christian TV now, he's a snake oil salesman, he's hawking this holy water. You know, for like, I think it's like a $1,000 offering or $500 offering or I mean, it's just like, I look at this stuff, and it's all about, you know, you can have prosperity in your lap if you just give $500. Will you pledge $500 monthly? It's like, what? What does this have to do with anything? And a lot of people tune in on this stuff, and they just start laughing. They think that this is what Christian TV is, or this is what Jesus is, or Christianity is. And nothing can be further from the truth. It's not what it's about. It's, it's like, it's just a bunch of money-grubbing guys that are, you know, doing what you're doing and, and fleecing Fleecing the flock. I mean, that's what they're doing. It's just, it's just dreadful. So, I'm not sure I'm going where I'm going with this thing, but I just want to close by saying this. It's, it's, uh, um, we've had a, a great hour here, and and I'm excited about Watchers Seven. Thanks for having me on to talk about it, um, and and of course the book which will accompany that. Uh, we are going back to Peru in January. I'm leading a tour down there. We need some more signups before we can uh, actually make the tour happen, and that is. Uh, the latter part of January. I will post that on my blog tomorrow, lamarzuli.wordpress.com. If you're interested in going to Peru, uh, shoot me an email, la at lamarzuli.net, la at lamarzuli.net. And, of course, you can buy the Watcher series and on the trail of a Nephilim, which we didn't get time to talk to you tonight about. But uh, you can go to the website, lamarzuli.net, and check it out for yourself. And I will put all of the links to all of that in the show notes so that everybody can – find your information and find you and and I just want to say on a personal note when when I started my website several years ago I was always trying to reach out to different people in the paranormal world and in the new age world for interviews or even just guidance and you know it really struck a chord with me when you mentioned how you had gotten on the phone and called IDE Thomas when you were first saved to ask uh questions and and seek clarification and when I was first saved one of the first things I did was I I'm trying not to get emotional but I shot an email to you Mm. and within 30 minutes you replied to me and it was it was a moment that that meant more to me than than even just the fact that you know here's this guy who I just you know heard on the radio and 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 he's emailing me, but it was because I had been searching for so long and nobody wanted to talk to me or very few people unless they had some sort of an agenda, and you didn't know who I was or where I was coming from, and you instantly replied to me and were more than willing to help and more than uh, accessible, so. Just on a personal note, I almost think it's a little bit surreal that <laughs> it started out with me hearing an interview with you, and here I am interviewing you myself. <laughs> and <laughs> it's so it's so cool the way the Lord works. And and I just want to thank you for doing this, and thank you for everything that you do, La. You, your 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 ministry is so important, and I'm really grateful for it. Well, I appreciate it, and I just want to say uh, to the King because. When he comes back, uh, everything changes, and uh, we all we all groan and wait for his uh, his coming. Amen. Thank you so much, Ellie. I can't wait to talk to you again. All right, Natalie. The pleasure's been all mine. Thank you so much. All right. Good night. Good night.
You've been listening to Beyond Extraordinary with Natalie Bat. For the latest headlines and program schedule please visit ExtraordinaryIntelligence.com.